Um, but yeah, today I'm going to talk about um, how recent developments in ancient DNA have affected um, sort of reconstructions of uh, ancient people in the past, particularly reconstructing and uh, made people rethink reconstructions uh, with respect to pigmentation characteristics. So before we, we had ancient DNA or at least I, a reliable ancient DNA, a lot of the pigmentation characteristics given to facial reconstructions or reconstructions of people in prehistory, and um, this is primarily what I'm talking about, prehistoric Europe and uh, Britain specifically, were often based on assumptions that of uh, population continuity, that in the absence of any firm evidence either way, that it was just easiest to assume that people um, who lived in a certain place in prehistory were similar to people look or looked similar to people who live there um, today. And there, at the time, there was some very weak evidence about this from modern genetics, but it was weak. Um, and I guess this is a reasonable uh, thing to do, but it's also sort of um, conveniently quite uncontroversial and appeals to um, uh, sort of the sen a, a sort of later nativist sensibility of people who are often consuming these sorts of exhibits and this sort, sort of information, uh, who are largely older white um, people um, and, and sort of appeals to an idea of the, of the same people having persisted in that area for long periods of time and sort of um, indelible connections between ancestry and uh, place. And I've included this reconstruction here because this was a quite a recent reconstruction of uh, a beaker burial from Akavanich dating to the um, Calcolithic, uh, where they were given characteristics, quite, I guess, stereotypical characteristics for Scotland of uh, blue eyes and red hair and uh, pale skin pigmentation based upon the physical characteristics of people who live in that area today. Um, what the new uh, advances in sequencing technology, next generation sequencing technology particularly have allowed us to do is get genetic, genetic information from the entire genome. And this gives us rich information on uh, people's genetic ancestries and how they change through time, but also they can give us information on specific genetic variants that are linked with phenotypic characteristics in people, including sometimes pigmentation characteristics in, in living people. In terms of genetic ancestry, what the genetic ancestry has shown us for Britain is that un unlike those assumptions that were made with respect to the um, older facial reconstructions is that uh, there's very little genetic continuity through uh, prehistory, particularly in prehistoric Britain, but also Europe to some extent as well. Um, and this is uh, that there's been multiple large scale shifts in genetic ancestries as a result of uh, migration and uh, admixture at different uh, periods. And this is sort of illustrated quite well by the fact that um, uh, in this principal component analysis distributes uh, people uh, in space, depending on how genetically similar they are to each other, and these populations in the middle, these sort of faded populations, are from living people, uh, living people with ancestry from recent ancestry from Europe, and the sort of more solid uh, icons are uh, ancient people, and the, the burgundy icons represent Mesolithic populations of Europe, and the green, specifically Mesolithic populations of Britain. And you can see that they sit outside the genetic variation of, of uh, people with recent ancestry from Europe more broadly, uh, because of the uh, genetic transformations that have taken place between the Mesolithic and today. Um, and as well as genetic ancestry, as I say, we can always look at these pigmentation loci, these genetic variants that are associated with pigmentation. And pigmentation characteristics, hair, skin and eye pigmentation are all polygenic, meaning there's not just one gene uh, which affects them, but they're influenced by many uh, genetic variants distributed across the genome sometimes. Uh, certainly dozens, maybe uh, probably hundreds and uh, possibly thousands of genetic variants. Um, and most of these variants actually have quite a small effect overall uh, in change in, uh, or a sort of minor relationship to skin pigmentation, in terms of pigmentation. With um, skin pigmentation, there are these two genetic variants uh, in these two genes, which have uh, a disproportionately large effect. So they explain the, the majority of the variation, genetic variation between uh, in, in pigmentation between people who with recent ancestry from West Africa and people with recent ancestry uh, from Europe and everything else sort of controls pigmentation on the outskirts uh, of that to some extent. Um, and um, the reason why people start looking into pigmentation variation is because there was an established idea that when populations moved into Northern Europe, they quickly developed lighter skin pigmentation um, 
um, um, is as a, an adaptation to the low levels of sunlight so that they, uh, their skin becomes more efficient at absorbing uh, vitamin D, which allows you to uh, avoid you becoming vitamin D uh, deficient. But then when um, this individual's genome was published as mesolithic burial from Labrania, um, and then later other mesolithic individuals, they found that they lacked these two big genetic variants associated with lighter skin pigmentation, but did carry a different genetic variant associated with light pigmented eyes. So, so uh, inferring this sort of interesting phenotype of darker skin uh, and lighter colored eyes, so green, blue, or hazel eyes. And this was interesting because this sort of established narrative of the selection for lighter skin pigmentation in Europe hadn't happened in the way that was had been anticipated. So further to this, uh, there's been these uh, models developed um, in forensics for trying to predict um, skin pig pigmentation in modern people. And this uses li living people from around the world and associations with genetic variants to um, try and predict um, pigmentation uh, very broadly on these um, Fitzpatrick scale categories based on their uh, DNA. I should say they're very large uncertainties attached to some of these, which is why you get these sort of really large ranges of um, uh, skin pig pigmentation predictions. And when these have been applied to Mesolithic populations of Europe specifically, they found that um, the predictions usually vary between uh, four uh, and six on this scale with, with the sort of most probable um, um, sort of uh, prediction being around five. Uh, and that's what's often used in these reconstructions of Mesolithic people um, as a result. I mean, it, it covers a very broad range of pigmentation possibilities, to be, uh, covering pretty much everything that's uh, outside what is typically associated with um, Europe. So this is basically saying that these populations were probably, that their skin pigmentation was probably darker than uh, what we generally associate with Europe today. Uh, but then how dark that is within that time frame is more is more difficult to um, to uh, to determine. Um, and there are problems with these predictive models developed on living people. Um, they don't work so well on understudied populations like populations of South America, where you have very complex recent admixture events between populations who had otherwise been largely uh, separated. Um, but this probably doesn't apply so much to Mesolithic populations of Europe because the population to which they are most related to, despite being sort of quite um, apart from, are living people who uh, from who have recent ancestry from Europe, so which who are a, a chronically overstudied group. So we have a good idea of variation in skin pigmentation amongst living people with recent ancestry uh, from Europe. But it's possible that these Mesolithic populations, as they essentially no longer exist in admixed form, carry genetic variants that um, uh, uh, serve to lighten the skin pigmentation or, or even darken them, but which no longer exist in living people. Um, again, one um, sort of important um, sort of repost against that idea is that we see intense selection on the main variants linked to light skin pigmentation in people in Europe since the Mesolithic. Um, so you can see these plots are showing one particular genetic variant and how it changes through time in different parts of Europe. And we see it, it from the near, uh, it's beginning with the Neolithic going even into recent times. And we can see that selection is happening. These, these variants are getting more frequently through time um, all the way from the Neolithic right into um, sort of more recent times, but beyond the, the Iron Age and into historic times. So this backs up the idea that uh, it's, it's difficult because of the strong association between this genetic variant and skin pigmentation, as well as a lighter skin pigmentation, as well as other genetic variants linked to skin pig pigmentation, it's clear that uh, that this has to be selection for lighter skin pigmentation. So by definition, people further back in the past will have had darker skin pigmentation going into the Neolithic, and especially then um, in, into the uh, Mesolithic. Uh, I can see there's a lot of trepidation potentially about using these sorts of reconstructions as they attract a, a disproportionate amount of negative attention, particularly more recently, Cheddar Man and White Hawk Woman from Brighton Museums and these claims of institutions politicizing the past. And this has all been sort of uh, feed into the current ongoing discussions around uh, the supposed culture wars that are taking place in, in cultural heritage. Um, but it, it's not no longer, I don't think, evidentially tenable to be able to uh, go with these reconstructions that simply use the physical characteristics of the people in that place as, as, as a guide. This is a, an updated version of that Ava Beaker burial that I showed at the beginning. Um, 
where uh, it, it, which is used some of the DNA pigmentation variants that suggested that rather than being this sort of light skinned, um, red haired, blue eyed uh, person that she probably would have had more of an intermediate skin pigmentation, um, dark uh, eyes and dark hair, brown eyes and, uh, and sort of black hair, again, sort of uh, pushing against that um, stereotype of what of uh, people in the past being looking the same as people who live in these areas today. Um, and also the, 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 the ideas that those sorts of rep, um, reconstructions represent that there's um, deep continuity between people who live in a place in the present and people who lived in a place in prehistory are no longer hold for prehistory. We know that there's big changes in the genetics of people who live in these places through prehistory. It, it may be that to avoid uncertainty, uh, people might be tempted to um, avoid depicting pigmentation characteristics altogether. And this is from Reading Museum. I'm not having a Reading Museum specifically over this. So this is probably done even before there was any kind of uh, ancient DNA analysis. This is just an example of one way in which you could potentially depict prehistory without having to think about uh, pigmentation. Um, and there are creative ways of doing this, but the problem is, is that while the older reconstructions persist and, and sort of predominate in, in museums and, and other sort of uh, public spaces, this is not a neutral uh, way of doing things. If you avoid depicting them, then essentially by pro by default, you're endorsing these older reconstructions that are most that are more prominent. So I, th I think it's clear, and I think that it's priced into facial reconstructions that um, it's uh, impossible to be hundred to produce a reconstruction with hundred percent certainty uh, of any aspect of facial reconstructions. Uh, but it's broadly accepted now that prehistoric populations of Europe, particularly in the Mesolithic, had darker skin pigmentation than what we generally associate with Europe today, and that the assumptions of population continuity that often fed into the reconstructions of the past aren't really tenable. Um, but we were sort of left with this idea, how do we illustrate these new developments and produce reconstructions uh, with it and, and illustrate the attached um, uncertainties? Um, and uh, if, if, if attempts to avoid the issue, so if it becomes too uncertain and to try and if you feel people feel like it's too uncertain and to try and sort of do reconstructions without sort of having to use pigmentation, that's not neutral because you are essentially to some extent endorsing what already exists, which are these older, more wrong reconstructions, which depict prehistoric people as looking exactly like what people are today. So hopefully that raises a few interesting questions in people's minds. And thank you very much for listening.